Hey bag maker, today I'm going to be talking about scissor clips, new fabrics that I've added to my stash, also some new quilt patterns that I picked up recently, and I'll be demonstrating how to convert a bag into a backpack. I'm Sarah Lawson from Sew Sweetness. Thanks so much for joining me for Social Sunday, my weekly sewing chat. Hey everyone, happy Sunday and welcome to Social Sunday. Thank you so much for joining me for the show. Um, I, Danny's about to put some of your comments up on the screen, I think. Bachelor. <laughs> I see Charlie's watching from Connecticut, Brenda from North Carolina, Marie's watching from Daytona Beach, uh, Susan's watching from New Zealand, and Donnie B from Australia. So welcome everyone to the show. A friendly reminder before I get started, just about everything that I talk about during Social Sunday are things that I've purchased myself. So these are not things that I'm getting paid to talk to you about, but just cool things that I found that I'd like to share with you. And everything that I'm scheduled to talk about, I link to in the description. So if you're interested in finding out more about any of the notions, fabrics, books, or projects that I talk about during the show, just check that link in the description and you can find out more information there. And as always, if you think of a question that you would like to ask me live, it can be a general sewing question, bag making question, a question about a notion or tool. You can type your question in the comments anytime during the show. My husband Danny will be collecting comments throughout the show and I'll answer as many questions as I can later on. So the notion of the week is something that I found, it seems like a simple idea, but will avoid some frustration if you live in a household with people that are constantly trying to borrow your scissors. So Danny's gonna switch to the overhead camera. This is a three pack of uh, scissor ID clips. They're magnetic, so they just clip to the handle of your scissors and you can remove them whenever you'd like and they're already labeled. So. In the pack, there's one for paper, one for fabric, and one for your thread snips. So these are my paper scissors, and I decided to clip these on to this um, part where my thumb goes. I tested on uh, both sections, and I felt like it just was least in the way um, in, in the thumb hole. And of course, I'm gonna stick this on my fabric scissors because everyone's always trying to use my fabric scissors for opening boxes that they got delivered, slicing tape on things, cutting plastic packages open. So these are the scissors. That's a no-no. So <laughs> in case everyone in the house didn't already know, these bright orange scissors, now it says right here, it's for paper. So um, again, a simple, rather simple notion, but can be helpful and a link to that uh, notion, that little packet of the three clips is in the description in case you're interested in checking it out after the show. So I have a question for you. Let me know in the comments how many different types of scissors that you have approximately or at least that you can think of really quick. So I've got my fabric scissors, pinking shears, um, thread snips. I have, oh, what else, what else, what else do I have? And I do have multiples of each scissor. Um, I'm, I guess because over the years I've tested so many different products for the show. Cindy says, awesome idea for clips. Too bad we can't lock them closed. Yeah, that would be a really great idea if we could have like a little, a little locking mechanism. I guess you could just purchase a little lock, but a little lock on the fabric scissors so nobody could use them. That's a great idea too. <laughs> um, so lots of fabric, like I mentioned on the last show, lots of fabric I've added to the stash over the summer and I've been saving them by my cutting desk to, um, mention on the show so uh, big stack to talk about today these fabrics i didn't purchase the whole fabric line but i just really liked the sort of painterly looking flowers this one's sort of a bluish background with some purple and this is sort of the mauve background in case that's not coming up properly on camera and i thought it would be interesting for some reason the renegade bag popped into my head when i saw these are the airplane bag although I'm not sure what uh, the finished project will be for these two. And then some really fun dog themed fabric. So this one, paw prints, 
It's sort of like a city themed dog fabric line. So I picked up, I didn't pick up every single print, but I picked up the major graphic looking ones, um, bricks and rainbow splatters. Since I'm from Chicago, I, I always like a cityscape type of fabric, which this is, this one's really cool, would be cool on its own. And then the two dog prints, I picked up this fabric and then there's also a panel. So as you can see by my hands, that's the scale of the dogs in this one. Actually, let me open that up a little bit. <clears throat> I just thought this one was really cool. I liked all the colors, like how all the dogs look on this fabric. And then the panel, I think, Danny, can I have you switch over to the front camera for just a second? Because I think these are kind of on the large side. Let's see if I can do my best to hold all of these up. So I'll show you, this is sort of the front half of the, the panel and then the other side is this. So now that I think, now that I look at this, Violet's been asking for a tote bag for school. Maybe she'll let me talk her into using one of, actually two of these uh, cute prints from the panel of her choice to make a tote bag. That would be a really great looking tote bag. Okay, Danny, back to the overhead camera. This last stack of fabrics is um, lawn fabrics, actually, from Anna Maria Horner. So a little bit lighter would be really nice for a summer top or a really light pair of shorts or a skirt. Um, I do plan on using some of these for bags. And so what I would do usually with a garment fabric like this lawn is I would first interface it with Pollen Shape Flux SF101. And then I would use the interfacing as called for in the pattern, usually in my patterns foam interfacing, just because it's kind of on the thin side and the shape flex will give it some extra uh, stability before attaching to the foam. So I picked up actually every single print from this fabric line. And some of these are prints that you may have seen in some of her older lines, but maybe recolored slightly. I'll save this one for last because it's my favorite. There was also a wide back too. I didn't purchase that one, but I kind of saved it on my wish list just in case I want to make like a really big skirt because that wide back would be really convenient to make a, a large article of clothing with. Let me pull this one and then I'm going to move these out of the way because the last few are sort of the bigger scale prints, which I usually love. This one's super cool, lots going on here with the flowers and the little tick marks in the background. And then there's another of the same design, different colorway. I don't know, between the two, I almost really like the green butter, but they're both pretty amazing. And then the last two with some butterflies, this one's purple with yellow. And then I almost feel like I want to buy two more yards of this and I don't even know what, what for or why, but I just, I love the color combination. I love the butterflies, green. I, I don't often get nice green fabrics in my stash. So again, this last set of the lawn fabrics, that's from Anna Maria Horner. And I've linked to all of the fabrics in the description in case you're interested in checking those out after the show. And Danny, you could switch back to the front camera. All right, so I have another question for you. Let me know in the comments. Uh, what is your favorite type of dog or cat? So I was showing those dog fabrics. Initially, I was going to put just what's your favorite type of dog, but I know there's dog and cat people, so I slipped cat in there as well. Let me know in the comments what's your favorite type breed, if you will, or you can just put a type of dog um, in the comments, and uh, I'll, I'll be checking that out after the show to see what your all favorites are. So earlier today I made, I'm a big fan of Panera squash soup, which they have every fall and winter. And I just noticed it came back on the menu. And so, hey, yes. Did you have a Washington Post article or something? Oh, I did. I did this last weekend too, talking out of uh, turn on my outline. Uh, let's talk about the soup, Danny, first, and then uh -huh. we'll we'll slide that information about the Washington Post article in there. So um, back to the Panera squash soup. I've had this recipe that I've been saving for a little bit and I decided it's finally time to make it. So I used some of the vegetables from the farm in combination with some I purchased because 
Um, here in Illinois, squash is butternut squash is not yet in season. Uh, so Danny's going to put a picture up on the screen of the squash soup. This is from the recipes website. And I do have to admit, since I just actually had the Panera version a couple days ago, this copycat recipe, which I've linked to in the description, is it tastes the same, just the thickness is a little bit off. So the copycat recipe is a little bit thinner of soup. So I think maybe next time I make it, I will take down the amount of the vegetable broth a little bit. Uh, but otherwise it tastes just like the soup from the restaurant and I was super pleased. I made a double batch just because I like to freeze it in one cup increments. So then during the winter for lunch, I can just take a packet out of the freezer and um, heat it up on the stove and that's my lunch. So again, recipe for that squash soup is in the description. And yes, Danny, now we will get uh, back on track with that um, other thing that I wanted to talk about. This really great article that I came across from the Washington Post. Um, Danny's actually going to put, it's sort of um, not a graphic novel, but a graphic article. So they used illustrations to get the point across. So I've linked to the article in the description, but we're gonna put some of those graphics up on the screen. And again, please do reference the actual Washington Post article, um, especially if you'd like to share uh, the article with some of your friends online. So Danny, go ahead and uh, post those graphics for us. And I'm just gonna read these out loud. My grandma once told me, you're so artistic, I've never had an artistic bone in my body. She said this while sitting in a chair she herself had designed and embroidered. She said this to me as I sat next to her enormous homemade tapestry dedicated to the man she loved. You get it from your maternal grandfather. He drew so much. Yet the room we sat in was filled with her intricate creations. And not just her work, her shelves were filled with bone and wood carvings by the women who came before us too. Their prolific pieces mounting the walls depicted folk stories, fantastical creatures, romantic nature, goddesses, and unrestrained dreams. I thought too of the multiple sweaters and other garments she'd knitted me throughout the years, each carefully crafted with colors I loved. I wondered about the countless unacknowledged women whose art is hiding in plain sight. How much talent has gone uncelebrated because we feel entitled to women's work. Yet she told me, your grandpa, he drew so much. I've never had an artistic bone in my body. So yeah, I thought that that really struck a chord with me and I thought it was really interesting that women's work is just sort of um, expected, sometimes not acknowledged, perhaps uh, criticized in a way, like especially sewing. Oh, that's, you know, that's not for a young person. Um, knitting crochet falls in with that. Um, home decorating, baking. I think uh, those are not things that everyone knows how to do, but things that people learn if they want to learn. And so, um, yeah, it was really interesting. And let me know in the comments if you had particular feelings about that particular Washington Post article. But um, yeah, I thought it was a really great, made a really great point. And again, I've linked to the, the article in the description in case you're interested. So. Danny's favorite part of the Sunday show when he's not on it, we'd like to invite all of the bag makers to stand proud. Let us know in the comments that you're part of the So Sweetness squad. Danny and I are both really happy and grateful that you've tuned in to uh, tonight's episode, whether you're watching it live or watching the recording later on during the week. So we really appreciate you and thank you so much. All right, so the demonstration for tonight is how to convert a, back, uh, a bag into a backpack and this topic came up this week because I had a couple of emails from people that were asking how to make a particular bag into a 
single strap or sling backpack. And the one that comes to mind is um, they were asking how to make the widget messenger bag, which is a crossbody adjustable strap, how to make that into a sling bag with just a single strap. And um, so this demonstration would be perfect for either that if you just want to have a single strap and make it into a sling backpack or if you want if you do want the two straps uh, to make it into uh, a regular shoulder backpack. So um, enjoy the demonstration. I'm going to demonstrate how to convert a bag into a backpack and it's really quick and easy to do. I've had a few requests for it uh, recently. Um, so before I jump over to the side camera and show you how to do that, my demonstration will be using the Tudor bag backpack. So I'm going to be using uh, the back panel of the bag to attach the straps to, but you can use this same method for just about any bag that you would like to turn into a backpack. I'm going to show you how to add the backpack straps to the back of the bag. And even though the Tudor bag does come with the side strap in the instructions, if you're working with a bag pattern, that you would like to have that side strap on as well, just so you can have um, an actual bag as well as a backpack. I also have a free add-on video on my YouTube channel for adding an adjustable strap to any bag. So if you'd like to do that, just check out the YouTube, uh, YouTube channel and look for the adjustable strap video and you can add that to any bag as well. So I'm gonna jump over to the side camera and show you how, that I, how I added the straps to the backpack. So Danny's gonna throw up a graphic on the screen really quick and this graphic is going to tell you all of the extra items that you'll need to cut for your backpack. So those are the pieces that you'll need to cut from your fabric and you'll also be using ShapeFlex interfacing for all those pieces. And you'll need uh, two bits of hardware. So two each, you'll need two one inch rectangles and uh, two one inch sliders. Okay, so um, let me start off by showing you how you're going to press all of those pieces. So you're going to press all the pieces the same way. So all of the four inch squares. Um, I have an optional loop for the back of the backpack just so you can hang it on a hook. And then you'll need the two long strap pieces that was what were in my list. So you're going to press these kind of like double full bias tape. So you're going to press in half wrong sides together. You're going to open up the fabric and press in toward the center crease and then refold everything and press one more time. So after you've pressed all of those pieces in the same manner, you're gonna to top stitch. So I've got a little sample over here that I've top stitched in black thread so you can see my stitching. So usually I like to lengthen my stitches for top stitching, so I lengthen usually to three millimeters and then I top stitched an eighth of an inch away from both of the finished edges of the fabric. So you're gonna do that with all of the pieces. Um, it is a total of five pieces that you're gonna do this with. Okay, so the hardware that you'll need uh, for the backpack are two one inch rectangles and two one inch sliders. So um, you may have a slider with um, the middle bar that's movable and some sliders have just a static bar that doesn't move. So either way, either one is fine. And I went ahead and prepared before the show uh, the back of the bag, which is uh, for, the Tudor back, for the Tudor bag, although if you're working with a different project, you'll of course, um, your piece might look slightly different. So I went ahead and attached my exterior fabric to the interfacing. And you can go ahead and attach these um, extra straps uh, before you start constructing the bag. And I'm gonna have Danny zoom out just a little bit so we can see the, the full shape of uh, the rectangle. Okay, there we go. All right, so I went ahead and before the show attached one half of the strap. And I'm gonna show you how to attach uh, the strap to the second second half of the bag. So you'll just need to decide how far you want your straps in from the sides and you'll just have the same measurement for the left hand side as for the right hand. So I just arbitrarily decided I was going to do three inches in from both of the side edges. Actually I'm going to take my pen for this one and I'm just going to draw a vertical line that's three inches in and I'm going to use this line for both um, the little four inch square on the bottom and then the long strap gets attached to the top. So First, I'm going to start with that little four inch square that I pressed and top stitched and I'm going to go ahead and slide that metal rectangle on there. Okay, so I'm going to align the raw edges. I'm going to bring those together and I'm also going to align them with the bottom of the main panel. So I'm going to place it just to the inside of the line that I drew and I'm going to wonder clip that in place. So you'll be taking this to the sewing machine and sewing an eighth of an inch away from the bottom edge of the fabric and this is optional but you can also choose to top stitch the this little tab down close to the hardware so i stitched down about 
a half inch away from the hardware just to keep it in place so it's not flapping around. Okay, so now I'm gonna take this long strap piece and this is the piece that I cut uh, with the fabric times four inches. And I'm going to align that at that same three inch line but at the top of the bag. And then I'm gonna stitch this edge down also using an eighth of an inch seam allowance. So I'm just gonna use the Wonder Clips to hold that in place for the demonstration. And now it's time to add the slider. So to do that, I'm just gonna make sure my strap is not twisted. And I'm gonna be working with the, the top of the strap or the right side of the strap. And I'm gonna go ahead and place it over and under that middle bar on the metal slider. Okay, so I'm gonna take the loose end of that long strap and place it through the top of the metal rectangle and then pull a little bit of it through. It's also going to go over and underneath the back side of that metal slider, the bar that you can see. And I'm just gonna go ahead and push some of that fabric away just so that I can get to it. And again, it's gonna go over and under that middle bar and I'm just gonna bring it back down. Okay, so I'm gonna pull enough of that strap piece through so that I could stitch the strap to itself. So when I say to itself, the piece uh, where it came through the bar and I'm just going to fold that over by about a quarter of an inch twice. Okay and I'm going to stitch the strap to itself an eighth of an inch away from that folded edge and also a quarter of an inch away and I'm just going to put a wonder clip on there for now. And I thought it might be nice to have kind of an optional loop on the back of the backpack just in case you'd like to have it kind of um, draped over your arm if you're not using it as, as a backpack or um, when you get home if you want to just hook it um, on a hook by your front door. So I added an optional cut of fabric to make a loop. And for this loop, I'm just going to place it about two inches apart. And again, I'm going to stitch the raw edges down using an eighth of an inch. And you can certainly cut this longer if you'd like. But this is just a loop, like I said, if you just like to have it um, not as a backpack, looped on your arm. Um, but otherwise, um, as you can see, super quick and easy. The straps on the backpack are adjustable. And if you do decide to add that optional side strap with the swivel clips, you can have a bag that's a bag as well as a backpack. All right, so I hope you enjoyed uh, that demonstration. Um, you can either use that method that I just showed you, or if you have one of my other backpack patterns, patterns like the park sling, um, if you prefer using the backpack, the actual backpack straps for those patterns. But I feel like um, with the adjustable strap method that I just showed you for that demonstration, I feel like it gives it a really modern look. So I think it would pair really nicely with a bag such as the Tudor bag or any other bag that you'd like to turn into a backpack. It makes it look really modern and not, not so much backpack-ish looking. So I uh, hope you've enjoyed that demonstration. Um, if you have ideas for future demonstrations, let me know. I'm always on the lookout for some new ideas. I posted last weekend in my Facebook group asking for ideas and I had so many good ones come through. So if you have any ideas for me, just let me know. You can either post in the Facebook group, uh, you can comment on the show, or you can even email me. My email is sarah at soulsweetness.com and that's Sarah with no H. So like I was mentioning earlier, if you wanted your bag to be a sling backpack with just the single strap instead, um, in my demonstration, I had the two tabs uh, vertically positioned at the bottom of that bag panel. You could potentially have one of the tabs uh, or two if you want one on each side of the bag, um, but place them horizontally and with a D-ring instead of a rectangle ring if you wish. And then if you have one on each side, then you can switch which side um, that single strap is clipped to depending on what direction you'd like to wear that single strapped bag on your back. Um, all right, so I'm, a bunch of new patterns that I've added to my stash instead of the book review for this week. So Danny's going to switch back to the uh, overhead camera. So a few new patterns that I picked up from Stacy and Stitches. And this one's for Labyrinth and it's mostly just the black and white fabrics. And I think I might use little pieces of scrap fabric for the little colored segments in the quilt and um, her patterns are full color step-by-step -step instructions and this one does have some partial partial y seams which um not difficult i already read through the instructions and everything seemed fairly easy to understand so 
I really like the graphic nature of this quilt and especially, I don't know that I have any quilts that are just black, mostly black and white like this one. So can't wait to make this quilt. Um, this one's Supernova and it is a log cabin style star. Finishes at 54 inches and a half by 54 inches and a half, so a good size quilt. And um, really like the possibilities for all of the different fabrics. I think looks like she used Allison Glass fabrics for the cover quilt. And then this Zinnia quilt uses templates, and I really like this one also. Um, these look like some V and Co fabrics over here. Not sure which fabrics, probably knowing me, I'll probably use solids for my version of the quilt, but looking forward to making this. And also my friend Charlie told me about these Janet Fogg quilt patterns, and they're mostly of different animals. And so I picked up these four, which I'll be sharing with you. And it uses piecing, and there's some appliques, such as for the nostrils, the nose. Um, needle turned applique is given in the instructions, but I think I'm going to use um, that lightweight fusible interfacing just so I can kind of sew my applique pieces right sides together and then st stitch them down. This macaw looks super cool. Love the love the, the florals in the combination with some of the the solid colors. And then the last one I purchased was this wood duck. So links to both the Janet Fogg patterns and the Stacey and Stitches patterns is are in the description. And uh, let's see, I'll be answering questions live in just a minute. So if you do have a question and you haven't posted it yet, go ahead and post your question for me in the comments right now. And I'll answer as many as I can in just a moment. But first I wanted to announce the winner of last week's giveaway. And that winner is Patricia Sentliver. So congratulations to Patricia. Please email me after the show so that I can get you connected with your prize. And as always, thanks for watching. And there will be another giveaway at the end of tonight's show. All right, Danny, take it away with the questions. Lisa says, thinking of trying garment sewing for women's clothes, where do you suggest to shop for patterns? Actually, I like shopping for fabric at Hawthorne Supply Company, and they do have a good amount of garment patterns as well. So I suggest checking there. Um, they have some nice paper patterns in stock. Um, Suzanne wants to know, torn between the Juki 2000 QI or the Baby Lock Jazz 2 Thoughts. I don't really know anything about the Jazz 2. Um, the Juki 2000 off the top of my head, I think that's the machine that's similar to mine but without the speed control. So as far as I'm aware, um, it just has the single speed, um, which shouldn't be a problem. I'm, I'm really not changing my speeds up and down. Um, if anyone has any thoughts about the Baby Lock Jazz 2 though, let us know in the comments and Danny will try to put some of those up on the screen for Suzanne. Oh, I also, while I was answering that question, I was trying to think of the other good spot for women's garment patterns, and that's seam work. So every month they have new garment patterns coming out, and they've been doing this for a few years, so they have quite a huge library. And um, I myself have a lot of their, those patterns in my library, and they cover basics like uh, lingerie, swimming suits, shorts, pajamas, skirts, like everything. So check out seam work as well. Uh, for women's garment patterns. Laura says, where's the <laughs> painting that's usually between your bookshelves, Sarah? Just notice it's missing. So it fell down before the first show back after the summer break. I put new command hooks on it and I put it back up. Um, while doing so, I had to take the old command hooks out of, off the wall and I pull, pulled one the wrong way and I made uh, a hole in the wall so there's a big brown chunk missing. So when I put the new command hooks on, it was good for the first show back and then it fell down again. So I ran out of the command hooks that I needed for the strength of that picture. I just have like teeny tiny ones. So I have to buy more. So for now, um, nothing back there. <laughs> Patricia, Patricia says, have you tried Suzy quilt patterns? They are amazing. I think I might have purchased one or two. Definitely follow Susie on, I definitely follow Su Susie on Instagram. Um, she's also local to me in the Chicago area. Um, so check out Susie, Susie Quilts, I think, is the Instagram handle if you use Instagram. <clears throat> 
Margot says, Sarah, have you ever made one of Tula Pink's English paper piece in quilts? I have not made any of her designed quilt patterns or kits for English paper piecing, but if you're interested in that, they have some great English paper piecing supplies for some of her designs over on, I think, paper pieces, paperpieces.com perhaps, or .net, I'm not sure which. Um, but you can check that out if you're a fan of uh, paper piecing. And also, Pink Door Fabrics has some great kits for English paper piecing as well. Um, I think their new one might have been recently released or perhaps coming out soon, or maybe it's on pre-order, but that one is, um, that website is uh, Pink Door Fabrics. Um, Joanne says, Sarah, Sarah, I really like the way you offer so many options and help with methods through your demos and tutorials online. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. If you're looking some, for some of my other demonstrations, I think we've done probably well over 100 by now over the years. You can find it on my website so sweetness.com under the tutorials tab and there's a sub tab for bag making techniques and you can also find um, the same type of section over on my YouTube channel. Marie says, is the Juki QVP 18 good for sewing denim? Yes, actually it should be perfect for denim, especially since that particular machine has the new micro lifter feature. And you can, if you're not sure what that is, I did a very thorough review on my YouTube channel. If you go to the So Sweetness YouTube channel and in the search box type in Juki, that video should come up. And um, I believe if my mind serves me correctly, I did the demonstration and I also took some question and answers um, from that particular show. So that should all be in the video. Teresa says, when you install a magnetic snap, is the male side supposed to pull away a bit from the fabric? when you open the snap after it's installed or should I be gluing it down? Pull away from the fabric. Um, it really shouldn't be. I Actually, I usually like to purchase the thin magnetic snaps, but I have used the regular ones before in the past. Um, gluing it down. I've never tried gluing it down, so I can't give any feedback about that. But if you have glued the back of your mag magnetic snap down to the fabric, I think that's what she's asking. Uh, let me know in the comments. Let me know how, know how that went. Um, my initial thought is perhaps it needs a little bit more thickness or perhaps the prongs closed a little bit uh, better so it's more of a flatter finish. Um, what you can do or what you can test out in future is to take your fa same fabric combination that you did with that bag that that's happening to. Cut a little square of um, either Pellon Peltex interfacing or Decoville Heavy, whatever you have on hand. It could be a small square, like a one and a half inch square. And put that on the wrong side of the fabric before you either open or close the prongs, whatever your preference is, and see if that helps uh, make it a little bit tighter of a fit. Sue says, what originally brought you to the Jukies? I think the first person that I ever saw online that had a Juki was, um, uh, name is escaping me now, Victoria Finley Wolf. I saw on social media and I, I do know her in person. Um, she was using Jukis and I'm, I think I, then I, after that I saw her using them. I went online and checked out prices and, um, I think I, per I got my first one from Sovac Direct. Um, since then, the, the most recent one is from So Many Things in Florida, and that's M-I-N-I -I for So Many Things. Um, so if you're looking for Jukies, um, that's a great place to check out. They ship, they shipped mine to me as well. Um, Cindy says, they, the Jazz 2 had a lot of problems when I researched it, go with the Juki. Thanks for the feedback. That was an earlier question. Thank you, Cindy. Um, Linda says, what kind of serger do you use? So it's been a lot of years since I've made a garment. I used to make garments uh, quite regularly. Um, I do have the Juki Air Threader Serger. Um, my serger before that, my very first one was the Brother 30, 34D. I, I know I'm getting that number wrong. I know it has a 34 in it. <laughs> that was my first serger. It was fine, but I kind of really was interested in the Air Threader I also have a Juki cover stitch, but those are currently, I've got those displayed on the bookcase behind me because I had next to my computer a very nice display of the um, 
serger, the cover stitch, and so on. And I was never using them. They were mostly becoming a placeholder for stacking things on, like books, fabrics, things like that. So I thought it would be better to display them for now. And then when, if I should need them, I can just go ahead and grab them off the shelf. <laughs> Jan says, have you ever done a tutorial on piecing triangular fabric pieces together? I am currently making a hexagonal table topper using 60 degree triangles and having issues getting the points of the triangles to meet neatly. So I don't know if she has this particular tutorial, but I have a feeling she might because she's done hundreds. Um, my friend Vanessa at the Crafty Gemini, um, you can check her out on YouTube or on her website. Check if she has a tutorial on her website or YouTube channel on what you need figured out and if not let me know and I can send you a link to another channel that perhaps um, might have the tutorial that you need but uh, Crafty Gemini is always a great place to start for things like that. Um, Royce wants to know if you have a river press they make magnetic snaps that you can install with your press. Yes and I have those. I actually have a demonstration that I filmed. You can find that on my YouTube channel how to install magnetic snaps with a tabletop rivet press. Um, it's really fantastic and easy and the only difference in that particular magnet magnetic snap versus the ones that you install your, by, your, by hand yourself is that uh, the ones you install yourself have the prongs on the back and the magnetic snaps that you install with your rivet press have sort of a rivet looking finish on the back of that piece. Uh, maybe a slightly larger looking rivet but um, it's a really, really interesting and really cool finish um, if you have a tabletop rivet press. Any tips on how to keep the fabric from puckering when sewing pieces together? I run across this a lot when sewing bags with curves. I actually do have a video on my YouTube channel, How to Sew Through a Curve. So it, on my channel, if you type um, in the Sew Sweetness search box, I think you can probably just type in curve and that video should come up. And I have some tips in the video, um, so you might want to check that out. Diane, I love your picture, by the way, too. Um, speaking of prong closing, does it matter closing them together toward each other or out to the sides? Is there a better way? I usually close mine outward. I've seen a lot of pattern designers also close them inward. So uh, whichever your preference, I'm not sure if there's a bad way to do it, as I've seen it both ways. Uh, but that's just my personal preference, I guess. Sharon says, which juki do you use for making bags? So I have three. They're all three almost exactly the same minor changes in each one the newest one is the juki qvp uh tl18 um, but i do have reviews for all three of my machines and you can find that on my youtube channel if you just type in the so sweetness search box juki and those videos should come up i think the first two machines i reviewed in the same video and then the 18 is um, its own video by itself Royce says, starch is your friend when piecing triangles. Great tip, Royce. Thank you so much. Mary Ellen says, when sewing the triangles together, do not sew to the end. Leave a quarter of an inch unsewn, then the pieces meet together better. Oh, thanks for that tip, Mary Ellen. Avril says, which of your displayed bags is your favorite? I actually, I did have a, I'll have to say I did have a favorite and it's missing. Um, someone messaged me last year about... Um, a charity and so that bag went to that it was a cola coalition duffel bag if you've watched some of my older videos uh, maybe you remember seeing it was a, a big gray duffel bag with um, sort of metallic finish and it was um, an chino fabric but I would have to say that one was my favorite as far as the display bags go Kathy says, I'm happy to see you back. I've missed you, but I hope you had a restful break. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thanks for tuning in. I think since we've done, done the summer break this year as well as last year, I think we'll probably make it a habit just because um, it's a nice time to refresh. I definitely wasn't not working during the break because I was writing patterns and working on those, but it was nice to have a little change of scenery, especially since the kids were out of school. So. Are you calling in on the questions, Danny? 
All right, I apologize if I did not get to your question live, but I will be back again next Sunday and Danny will be joining me on next Sunday's show. The giveaway for this week is an Amethyst Project Bag pattern video and the interfacing to make the project. And if you already happen to have that pattern in video, then I'll just substitute another of your choice if you happen to be the winner. So this is, this is one of my um, current display bags. Um, this is one of the Amethyst Project Bags that I made. I made one years ago. I made one for each of my kids as well, and they used to carry... Um, books, coloring books, sketchbooks, that kind of thing inside. So they were the um, original inspiration for this particular pattern, but it also works great for storing quilt blocks in the bottom. This is a parachute clip, which you can open and close to cover whatever you're putting on the bottom. In my kids' case, their books. Um, in your case, perhaps quilt blocks. This can hold a 12 inch finished quilt block um, if you're if you'd like to use it for that purpose and at the top there's a mesh zipper pocket space for some pens or colored pencils a little zipper pouch and i've also gone through the facebook group and compiled some because this particular bag has tons of different uses besides just books or um sewing supplies but I found that you all had some great inventive uses for this pattern. So Danny's going to put some of those up on the screen right now. So the first one was made by Christy. She used it to store her cording that use, she uses for bag making as well as some of her acrylic templates. And I see some patterns in there as well. Abigail made this one with some Disney inspired fabric and pulls. And as you can see, her um, pencils fit in there really, really nicely. Gail made this one and she quilted some uh, feathers on the front and I just really like the pop of color that um, her particular amethyst project back gives off. Helena made hers with a clear vinyl window on the front and she made it to house um, quilt blocks that she was working on as she was making them for that quilt kit. Maria made this one to hold Legos and I really love the embroidery on the front. I mean it's just perfect and then the modified space at the top for the little Lego people. Marion made this one with some assembled quilt blocks um, and then there's uh, a quilt that she made in that bottom right hand corner as well. Marsha made this one for a really adorable doll that she made and I just really love this. It fits the doll clothes inside. Just super adorable. Paige made this one for some hand handwork supplies. Um, great to take on the go and have all of your supplies contained. Patri made this one for Barbies and Barbie clothes, and I, I really love the fabric. I mean, it's just perfect, and it's really adorable fabric, too. And um, so those are just some inspiration ideas for the Amethyst Project bag, in case you'd rather not make it for um, sketchbooks or quilting supplies. There's a lot of other uses for that as well. So for the giveaway, you have the whole week to enter up until the end of the day this Saturday, and I'll announce the winner on next Sunday's show. I compi compile all of the comments that were left on this show on Facebook and YouTube, add those together, and then draw one randomly drawn winner. So I have an extra bonus question for you that you can answer in the comments right now. What time do you usually eat dinner? So I was thinking about this earlier as I was eating my dinner, and I know there's a variety of times people usually eat dinner. On average, when do you usually eat dinner? Let me know in the comments. I, I feel like we're all over the place. Sometimes we're eating at 4.30, sometimes we're eating at 7, 8. Let me know in the comments what time your usual dinner time is. Good luck on the giveaway, and thank you so much for joining me for Social Sunday. I hope you have a great week, and happy sewing. Bye, everybody.